Alright guys, welcome back. Um, this is part four, I think, maybe, um, of our walk through the wonderful wacky world of Beowulf. I'm trying a slightly different mic setup this time, so you might hear a little more background noise. Um, we'll see how it goes and whether we keep this one on, but it's kind of nice not to have my giant earmuffs on and to be able to talk a little quieter in my house. Anyway, uh, when we left off, and we are looking at the abridged version of Beowulf from the Pearson textbook, so go ahead and open up your document and scroll down to where you see the number 11. We're on line 545. And when we left off, Beowulf had defeated Grendel by ripping his arm out of the socket and hanging it up as a trophy in the Mead Hall. And um, they'd had a huge celebration and it had been wonderful, but uh, Grendel's mama showed up that night after they had had this big celebration and everything. Uh, when they were sleeping, Grendel's mother shows up and kills one of the king's main men and drags his body off, basically, and grabs her son's arm because she's not going to let her son's arm be a trophy. I mean, imagine if your mama or grandma, uh, somebody murdered you and hung your arm up as a trophy, right? <laughs> they would not let that stand. So, Grendel's mother comes. Now, of course, Beowulf can't just go away and be like, well, I did what I came to do. Sorry, you have a new monster. Bye, everybody. Right? He's got to actually deal with Grendel's mother, who never gets a name, interestingly enough. We don't know what her name is. She's just Grendel's mother. Make of that what you will. Okay, so scroll down to line 545, and this is Beowulf, uh, this is the king describing where Grendel and his mother lived. They live in secret places. Windy cliffs, wolf dens, where water pours from the rocks, then runs underground, where mist steams like black clouds, and the groves of trees growing out over their lake are all covered with frozen spray, and the wind down snake-like roots that reach as far as the water and help keep it dark. At night, that lake burns like a torch. No one knows its bottom. No wisdom discovers such depths. A deer hunted through the woods by packs of hounds, a stag with great horns, though driven through the forest from faraway places, prefers to die in its shores, refuses to save its life in that water. This is some creepy description. This water is so dangerous, so mysterious, so creepy, that a full-grown stag, which if any of you guys have ever been hunting, I mean, bucks are huge, right? A full-grown buck would rather be hunted and killed by hunters on the shores of the lake than enter the waters of the lake and take its chances. So even animals are scared of this lake. It isn't far, nor is it a pleasant spot. Oh, <laughs> way to undersell that there. When the wind stirs in storms, waves splash toward the sky, as dark as the air, as black as the rain, that the heavens weep. Grendel's mother is hidden in her terrible home, in a place you've not seen. Seek it if you dare. Save us once more, and again twisted gold, heaped up ancient treasure, will reward you for the battle you win. Okay, so once again, um, if you open your notes, right, where it says connections to Anglo-Saxon culture and feudalism is one of the things we studied back in week two, right, where they talk about how the lords reward their thanes by giving them gold. Ding, 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 ding. Right at the end of this. 
and also the description of just the imagery in your notes, right? You've got a place about imagery. This whole thing is just a description of how freaking creepy the place where Grendel and his mother lives is. And whether it's whether it's creepy because they live there or they live there because it's creepy, we don't know. But we do know they're rejected by God, right? So they wouldn't go to a happy, sunny place full of flowers. Okay, keep scrolling down. Now, do you remember the hater Beowulf encountered earlier on Firth? Um, in one of the bits we skipped, Unferth apologizes to Beowulf for, you know, being horrible to him. And as an apology present, he gives Beowulf his own family's famous sword. So this is a pretty important and, um, like, symbolic gift of this sword. And the sword is called Hrunting. And it's in your italics there. So Beowulf is going to take this sword with him to fight Grendel's mother. Okay? Now, remember back at the beginning of the story, and, and it ties in with Unferth thematically, that Unferth was told Beowulf, hey, remember that uh, swimming contest with Brekka that you lost? We're going to see, and how Beowulf was like, I swam in full armor, blah, 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 I carried my sword in my teeth. We're going to see that same thing of him swimming in armor, carrying a sword, happen here. We already know he's capable of doing it and killing sea monsters, and that was foreshadowing for what's happening here. Okay, so scroll down to 570. This is Beowulf. Now, all his guys are waiting for him on the edges of the lake. But he goes in alone, because that's kind of Beowulf's style. He leapt into the lake, would not wait for anyone's answer. The heaving water covered him over. For hours he sank through the waves. At last he saw the mud at the bottom. Okay, so he sinks for hours now. Normal human people drown in the water. And not so much your boy Beowulf. He's not like a superhero. It just never occurs to him to drown. Okay, so he gets to the bottom, the muddy bottom of this lake, right? And of course, it's so dark, the water's so dark that the guys at the top can't see him. And all at once, the greedy she wolf who'd ruled those waters for half a hundred years discovered him, saw that a creature from above had come to explore the bottom of her wet world. Uar. She welcomed him in her claws. There's a little uh, understatement there. Very sinister. She welcomed him in her claws. And she's been down there for five, for 50 years, half a hundred years. So she's lived her whole life at the bottom of this uh, water. She welcomed him in her claws, clutched at him savagely, but could not harm him. Why couldn't she harm him? Exactly. He's wearing his armor tried to work her fingers through the tight ring-woven mail on his breast, but tore and scratched in vain. Oh, can't you just hear in your mind the sound of her nails scratching on his gold armor? <sighs> and you know that feeling, especially if you have long nails, if you've ever tried to pry something open with them? Yeah? Okay. So now she, she can't break into his armor. So what's she going to do? Then she carried him, armor and sword and all, to her home. So she just like picks him up and carries him. Remember, Grendel could pick up 30 men. So uh, the fact that his mother could pick up Beowulf like that shouldn't be surprising. He struggled to free his weapon and failed. So maybe it's in his sheath at his belt um, you know, maybe he's got it in hand. Either way, he can't swing it. He str uh, the fight brought other monsters swimming to see her catch. 
a host of sea beasts who beat at his mail shirt, stabbing with tusks and teeth as they followed along. Okay, so there's a bunch of sea monsters and, and big dangerous creatures at the bottom here of the lake. And um, just like uh, in the wild, right, if some animal catches something interesting or good, other animals will come check out what they've got. Um, or <laughs> think about middle school, right? If somebody in class opened a bag of Takis and suddenly everybody else in the class was like, ooh, ooh, what you got? Give me some. Ooh, what you got? Right? And so <laughs> Beowulf is a Taki. And so they're they're grabbing at him and, and trying to bite him, but he's got mail on, so it's mail armor, so it's uh, protecting him. Then he realized suddenly that she'd brought him into someone's battle hall. So this is like a mead hall but under, underneath the ground, uh, underneath the water, there's a, a hidden cave or a hidden building down there. And it, it's someone's battle hall, maybe it's hers, and where the water's heat could not hurt him. So the water was hot, um, and, nor anything in the lake attack him through the building's high arching roof. A brilliant light burned all around him, the lake itself like a fiery flame. So he's in a building and it's just him and Grendel's mother. The mighty water witch. And swung his sword, his ring marked blade, straight at her head. The iron sang its fierce song, sang Beowulf's strength, but her guest discovered no sword could slice her evil skin. So just like Grendel, weapons can't hurt her. So he finally gets his arm free and swings at her and hits her head with the sword and nothing. So this, that hunting could not hurt her was useless now when he needed it. They wrestled she ripped and tore and clawed at him, bit holes in his helmet, and that too failed him. For the first time in years of being worn to war, it would earn no glory. It was the last time anyone would wear it. So all of these things that he counts on to protect himself, right, that he didn't wear with Grendel, but he is wearing here, except for the, like, the chainmail armor, that was useful. The rest of it's not doing him any good. But... Beowulf longed only for fame, leapt back into battle. He tossed his sword aside, angry. The steel-edged blade lay where he dropped it. If weapons were useless, he'd use his hands, the strength in his fingers. So fame comes to the men who mean to win it and care about nothing else. Ooh. That's an interesting perspective on his character, isn't it? He raised his arms and seized her by the shoulder. Anger doubled his strength. He threw her to the floor. So those of you into wrestling, this is what he's doing. He's grabbed her shoulders and thrown her onto the floor. She fell, Grendel's fierce mother, and the Geat's proud prince was ready to leap on her. But she rose at once and repaid him with her clutching claws, wildly tearing at him. He was weary, that best and strongest of soldiers. His feet stumbled, and an instant she had him down, held helpless. Squatting with her weight on his stomach, she drew a dagger, brown with dried blood, and prepared to avenge her only son. Oh, isn't that a great mental image? There's Beowulf, tired, right, from his swim, from his battle, from being beaten up by all these creatures. He, he throws her, but she gets up and throws him down. Now he's flat on his back. She's sitting or squatting on his stomach, pulls out this blade with dried blood on it, and is about to stab him with it. Okay. But he was stretched on his back, and her stabbing blade was blunted by the woven mail shirt he wore on his chest. The hammered links held, the point could not touch him. So she stabs him in the chest, but he's wearing armor 
at chainmail armor and her blade is blunted and it can't penetrate. He'd have traveled to the bottom of the earth, Edge throws son, and died there if that shining woven metal had not helped. And holy God, who sent him victory, gave judgment for truth and right, ruler of the heavens. Isn't that, okay, remember the paganism to Christianity thing, right? Here, two minutes ago, all Beowulf cared about was glory. Now, suddenly our poet's like, he would have died there, except for his chainmail. Oh yeah, and God. God too. There's that weird juxtaposition. Okay. But he's still, like, she's still sitting on his stomach with a blade. Now, this is the moment in the movie, right? Or in any movie like this, where your hero is down. Where there's really no way your hero can win. They're overpowered, their weapons are useless, whatever's not working, yeah? And they're, they're cornered, and they're about to die, and then suddenly they notice something, or they see something, or something shows up to suddenly save the day. The, um, the eagles at the end of Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, Hulk in um, Thor Ragnarok, right? Hulk suddenly showing up. There's lots and lots of examples, and we're going to see one here. These things, when suddenly, when something suddenly shows up to save the day, kind of out of nowhere and is magic or um, totally unexpected, it's called a deus ex machina. It's a Latin phrase. Those of you who know Spanish or French or Italian will uh, catch some of those words. Deus means God. Ex means in. Machina means machine. God in the machine. And the reason it's called that is in ancient Roman theater, there was, in their theaters, there was literally a hole in the roof or in the ceiling, right? Where often during the end of a play, the god character or a, you know, one of the gods in the play would come down through the roof, like on a pulley, on a rope, as a character and fix whatever was going on. Okay, and it was called Deus Ex Machina, God in the Machine. So, the idea here, right, that we're going to suddenly get a solution out of nowhere, usually with some kind of supernatural or magic element, ding, 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 in your notes, elements of an epic, Deus Ex Machina. Ready? Okay, so we are on line six. 33. Beowulf's on his back. She's got the dagger to his chest. He's staring up. Then he saw, hanging on the wall, a heavy sword, hammered by giants, strong and blessed with their magic, the best of all weapons, but so massive that no ordinary man could lift its carved and decorated length. He drew it from its scabbard, broke the chain on its hilt. Okay, so he looks up, he sees on the wall this gigantic fancy sword. I don't know why she has it, but she does. He grabs the sword off the wall and it's in a scabbard, right? Which means the, the covering. He pulls it out. Now normally a sword is attached to a scabbard, especially if it's like ceremonial or decorative and not really meant to be used by a chain and then if you were going to use the sword you disconnect the chain kind of like a wallet chain so that um, it, it keeps the sword in the scabbard he breaks the chain and now he's got this sword okay broke the chain on its hilt and then savage now angry and desperate lifted it high over his head and struck with all the strength he had left caught her in the neck and cut it through, broke bones and all. Her body fell to the floor, lifeless. Decapitation! The sword was wet with her blood, and Beowulf rejoiced at the sight. Just in the nick of time, that's a deus ex machina for you. So he's cut off 
Grendel's mother's head with this big fancy sword, which, because it's a giant sword and because it's magic, could do the things that the regular human swords couldn't. Okay, um, go to line 646. The brilliant light shone, and suddenly, as through, though burning in that hall and as bright as heaven's own candle, lit in the sky, heaven's own candle will be the sun, he looked at her home. Okay, so there's this huge flash of light when he kills her. He looked at her home and then, following along the wall, went walking, his hand tight on the sword, his heart still angry. So he's going through the, the underwater castle, searching for something. What do you think he's looking for? He was hunting another dead monster and took his weapon with him for final revenge against Grendel's vicious attacks. His nighttime raids over and over coming to Herat when Hrothgar's men slept, killing them in their beds, eating some on the spot, fifteen or more, and running to his loathsome moor with another sickening meal waiting in his pouch. But Beowulf repaid him for those visits, found him lying dead in his corner, armless, exactly as that fierce fighter had sent him from Herat, then struck off his head with a single swift blow. The body jerked for the last time, then lay still. Okay, so he was searching through the castle for Grendel. He already knew he was dead. He couldn't have lived with his arm ripped off like that. But he's actually going to cut his head off in revenge. Because remember, he fully intended to kill him and he was kind of denied that kill by Grendel running away. So he's, in his own mind, finishing what he started. And we're going to pause there, okay? He actually takes the head of Grendel back up to King Hrothgar as a reward because remember... Grendel's mother took his arm away, so they don't have that in the Mead Hall anymore. So he takes Grendel's head and the hilt of this fancy sword, and he goes back and gets Hrunting, right, which is the sword he went down there with, because it was a gift, and you don't leave a gift just, even if it was kind of useless, uh, sitting on the floor, you bring it back with you. Um, and he takes the hilt of this giant's sword that he killed both of the, that he killed Beowulf, that he killed Grendel's mother, and cut off Grendel's head with. But the blade of the sword actually melts because of their blood is so acidic. So all he's got is the hilt or the handle of the sword. So he comes up with fronting, the handle of his giant sword, and Grendel's head and takes them all back to King Hrothgar. Okay, so we are going to pause there. I want you to go back into your notes for this section of Beowulf, um, and I want you to update your notes with everything we've seen in uh, Grendel's mother. Okay? And I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody.